All right. So, um, are you, so, okay, let me ask you this instead of when you're saying, what can we plant now for fall? What are you talking about? The crimson clover germinates and then dies back now. Hmm. So I, I, I guess then, then, um, then you should wait, but I assume that you're asking this because you want to start setting down some cover crops. Is that, is that correct? In preparation for the fall beds? Which veggies for fall? Um, I think, oh, I was actually just talking about this with my friend. I'll just, I'll show you one. As, as this always happens, you buy especially organic garlic, it starts germinating in, in the fridge. Um, but that would be something that I would, I would start, I would start doing that. Um, Oh, okay. Awesome. Wow. Maybe, um, <laughs> Linda, you can also help me out with some of these questions then. Since you, yeah, you have all, I can. I can. all these credentials. Please, please, please be free to uh, say something. Yeah, I'm going I think crimson clover, of course, can be planted now. Oh, well, I guess we should also ask user where they are, I guess, if, you know, and to preserve anonymity to give us the USDA zone number. Oh, in DC, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, if, it, if it's germinating, if you plant it now and it's germinating and then dies back, then I, I might wanna, I would hold off until the temperatures stop getting up to 90s at least. Um, or, Make, trying to get them in a, in a shadier spot or something like that. Going all out on leaks to avoid stink bugs. Hmm. Well, I still plant garlic um, uh, because it's ready um, and it'll go through the winter. I mean, like I'm saying, this, this garlic is gr growing in my refrigerator right now. So it'll, <laughs> it'll definitely work. Um, you know, and then it'll be ready next spring. I think also if you want to experiment with a little bit, you could um, you could um, plant like wheat or rye or some of those grain crops because that's uh, you know they, they 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 plant them as cover crops you know for this reason. But you want to you obviously want to get that winter wheat like the hard red or something like that. You can try it and see, um, but you wouldn't be able to harvest something like that until like next. I mean, around this time next year, when's it, when it's all done. Um, also, you could start working on the different um, brassicas, um, preparing beds for those, uh, you know, kale collards, um, maybe not collards, but different types of kales, radishes, um, um, broccoli, cabbages, because I know that broccoli I grew Siber the, that purple Siberian kale, I think, um, a couple of years ago, and it was still growing in the snow. This was in 2018, um, so it wasn't really that, or no, 2019, or 2018 to 2019, and it was still growing. I was growing bok choy. I really like bok choy. Um, yeah, well, they're going to they're gonna tear them up right now um, because it's too hot for the brassicas to keep going. Um, it's just, it's just too hot there. Like, like I was talking about, or like I will be talking about later. Um, uh, just as, just as we were talking about how increased, decreased temperatures in the wintertime. Welcome Veronica. Um, there you go. Yeah. And radishes and especially planting something like a mustard also, if you can find that, I like that wasabi mustard. Um, I don't think it's called, it might be called wasabi mustard. I don't, I don't know what it's called, but I know that Johnny's Selected Seeds has the variety of mustard leaves that taste just like wasabi. But I'm saying that because the, um, there's this part of agriculture called biofumigation and mustards and, um, and radishes, I think, can be ground up and applied to the soil and they can fumigate your soils um, and stuff like that. And, and 
especially like Sharon is talking about in companion planting, trap, trap planting and nurse cropping and stuff like that. Some of these brassicas have these compounds that will deter other pests for, um, uh, deter other pests from attacking the, the crops that you really want. Um, welcome Veronica, uh, like I said before, um, thank you for joining and sharing your time with us. We have a real treat. Linda here has some significant expertise, more than me, and, uh, and I look forward to her helping us constructively um, and, and sharing her experience also. I'm, I'm putting a lot of pressure on, <laughs> on her, I recognize that. Um, but um, anyway, um, oh, hold on. I just, I just, uh, oops. I just posted on Instagram and trying to get some people, some of my homies to join the class. Uh, oh yeah, Linda's on a video. What's up, Linda? Thank you for, for joining. Um, I think Thanks you're muted. Okay. Yeah, um, it's my pleasure. To, you know, I'm trying to get certified like you. It's uh, it's the beginning of my, uh, this is the fulfillment of my master gardener um, uh, uh, sort of certification at UDC because we weren't able to do, I got it in the winter time. Or, yeah, I got it in the winter, so there's no gardening in the winter. And then by the time the spring came around, you know, we're welcomed the virus. So I couldn't go anywhere. So, you know, we, we figured this out. So uh, you're muted. Uh oh, am I, am I frozen? Oh, sorry, I was getting a call. What is UBC? UDC, so the University of District of Columbia. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. I'm just putting this garlic away since, you know, since since we're all done. So let me um, get this uh, screen together, and then um, and then uh, let me break this screen out. Or where's the presentation one? That one is, we need this and just give me a little bit, you all. I'm very glad to have you. I think, I think one of my friends is coming, which is gonna be awesome because otherwise it's just been me making friends with strangers, which I have no problem doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> break this out also and then all right, so I need to get my notes together so I know what to say to you all. And then, um, yeah, I think it'll be an informative class. This will be the last class, so definitely give us, now that I'm not by myself in terms of knowing things, um, definitely definitely get some hard questions going so that we really, really start thinking about this stuff, you all. Um, and, uh, and we can keep going. So, all right, let me let me just, so this is up just a little bit more and then I'll share my screen and um, and then we can we can we can learn a portion of screen share. All right, let me expand this a little. Oh, I have to shrink this. I have to edit all this stuff out where I'm just mumbling to myself. <laughs> Just a second, just aligning perfectly here. Okay, is everybody seeing what I'm what I was doing? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now. All right. Let me uh, move these, move this over here. All right. So welcome to the last of these classes. Um, really glad to have everybody. Like I said before, and um, let me open up this chat window just in case. Um, uh, yeah, we got a really live chat today. Okay, um, so welcome to Urban Agriculture and Climate Change, the new normal. My name is Mason Trapio. I'm a you know, training master gardener um, through the University of DC of Columbia, which extension programs give away free seats. I may have to get back to you on that one. Um, let me write down these questions so that I can, I can find some of those. You might wanna look up your local seed library. Um, those places give out free seeds every now and then. Um, I don't know if extension um, yeah. programs A do lot that. of extensions do. Oh, okay. Which um, state 
Which state are you in? Uh, the user is in DC. In DC also. Hey, yeah, cooperative extension, they would know. Yeah. Um, but I'm writing, I'm writing these ones that I don't know down and I have, my plan is to uh, compile all these talks into one talk, all the audio, all the questions into one and then give that out probably in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. I wanna get that done by Labor Day, but taking tomorrow off because it's my birthday. Uh, all right, so let's begin. Objectives, you will gain an understanding of the myriad effects climate change is having on the urban and semi-urban farmer. We'll learn some suggested solutions to the potentially negative effects of climate change, and we'll share some tested varieties of common crops capable of handling the changing climate. The Future Ain't What It Used To Be is a, the title of a very popular song from 1977 with very somber lyrics. It could also be the title for a climate change scenario that we are facing today. The changes that we are expected to see are here. The last decade was the hottest on record uh, thanks to global warming, according to expert, experts at the National Oceanic Administ Atmospheric Administration and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. At the University of the District of Columbia, a land-grant university, our primary focus is on addressing the very critical questions related to urban agriculture. If you set aside the jokes about it, one thing is for sure. Mother Nature always bats last. Her batting average is very good these days. My personal edification and interaction with the change in climate occurred in the 90s while running a very small certified organic farm in Jessup, Maryland. I noticed that the early spring rains were extremely excessive. Scientists agree that the earth is getting warmer. Every year is warmer than the previous year. Also, if you are a very in tune farmer, you have probably noticed that the frost free se growing season is getting a little longer. Therefore, we suggest that two of the most important tools in the urban and peri urban farmers arsenal are imagination and practicing the art of being flexible. Which means that you must be ready to change. Farmers must be prepared to change crop varieties, crop planting dates and irrigation schedules. And we must be ready to learn. Immersing ourselves more in the pest and disease management and whatever other factors may affect urban agriculture as the plant warms. We have some suggested uh, areas that uh, growers need to look at, solutions for these, and how to implement adaptation for a successful crop production in this era of climate instability. We are entering the era of bigger and more prolific weeds. Of the four major green, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor, carbon dioxide is the one that probably affects urban growers the most. The reason is that carbon dioxide is essential to plant growth. As atmospheric carbon dioxide increases, plant growth is also expected to increase. In some cases, that may mean higher crop yields, but it also could mean higher weed populations. Some of the, could let me know if I'm going mean, to do that. It could mean greater compost too. Greater That's access true. to compost. That's a positive. Absolutely. Um, so some of the urban effects. Weed ecology and weed science are related and are very interesting courses at the university level. When I was a student some years ago, I could not wait to enroll in a weed science course. To my dismay, the course did not offer any strategies for ecological weed management. When I asked my professor about that, he rolled his eyes and said, sorry, sir, you are in the wrong class for that and continued to teach the conventional toxic cocktail, weed prevention and management methods. At that point, I realized that I had to, I quickly had to learn both methods of weed management, chemical and non-toxic. It is now documented that urban centers have higher temperatures and higher carbon dioxide levels in the summer than suburban areas do. Perhaps some growers do not have weed problems in their plots, but I'm sure many do. If you, ever, if you ever have an opportunity to take a short vacation from your garden plot, you will experience what happens when you are not there to perform weed management in a timely manner. How much damage can a weed cause? In some cases, you can have 100% crop loss. That is especially true for crops where the plant canopy architecture does not shade the soil from light, 
which causes constant germination of small weeds, seeds on the surface of the soil. Carbon dioxide is food for your plants and weeds. Weeds are opportunists and are widely adaptable to a range of environmental conditions. And as weather becomes more irrational and extreme, as seasonal fluctuations become more evident, as temperatures rise and rain changes, weeds with their high genetic variation and plasticity are likely to be the ecological winners. Weeds are like super athletes. They are highly competitive and have an excellent work ethic, which you cannot match. Some scientists proclaim that weeds will be at a disadvantage as carbon dioxide reduces crop and weed competition due to some very specific plant physio physiological traits. Another frustrating factor, um, especially early in the season where weed control is important, uh, is that you cannot always distinguish between the crop and the weed because they look alike. This is especially true when you direct seed crops into the soil. Sometimes they can look the same as they emerge from the soil. Later in the growing season, after the weed has had a chance to compete for light, nutrients, or water, growers may realize that they have been nurturing an imposter in their garden. It is sometimes too late to save the crop without a huge amount of weeding. Thus, one of the best management strategies you can employ as an urban grower is the use of summer and fall cover crops. Here are the six best and easiest ones to use in our region, mid-Atlantic, uh, to help address this issue. I just wanted to make a slight emphasis of this point with number two. Earlier we were talking about brassicas. Um, they're uh, especially some, like that can be kind of difficult. Now it's not so much of the case, but early in the spring when wild, um, wild canola, rape, whatever you want to call it, starts coming up or with garlic mustard, those can look exactly like what we want to grow. And so um, those are the, that's some of the things that we're talking about. Um, yes, absolutely. No, absolutely, absolutely the case. And especially, um, you know, uh, I think when, in my master gardener class, one of the one of the teachers was talking about um, pine finds. Sorry, just for you know, for listeners' sake in the future. Uh, the user asked, are mulch or straw good alternatives for weed management? Some people just use a tarp to overwinter. Yes, so yes, absolutely. Anything that is going to basically keep the soil covered is exactly what you wanna do. Um, and we'll go into that in our very next slide. Mother nature does not like her soil to be uncovered and neither should urban farmers. One of the practices that we see least, the least often in urban food plots is the use of cover crops. That should not be the case. Cover crops can be used to mitigate and adapt to, to climate change. More studies are coming out on the benefits of using cover crops to address climate change. The ancient practice of cover cropping is extremely critical in nutrient management, in the restoration of nitrogen and returning other nutrients into the soil. So using a tarp to overwinter is good, but what you don't do is necessarily keep that soil alive with something growing or something decomposing. The, the tarp will just sort of insulate that and keep that warm. If you were going to do something like that to overwinter, I would suggest building a hoop house instead if you're still going to involve that climate. That way you can have something growing throughout the entirety of the winter. So we have some more benefits to cover cropping. Returning these cover crops back into the soil also puts carbon dioxide back into the soil. Uh, that process is called carbon sequestration and addresses global climate change. The use of cover crops or green manures as they were once called is like in-ground composting. Those crops shade out heavy weeds, loosen heavy soil, and prevent soil compaction by heavy rain or snow and also prevent soil erosion. Cover cropping is perhaps one of the easiest and most beneficial things that you can do for your soil. I just wanna check and see, okay, no additional people. All right, let me just get a little bit of coffee here. Cover crop selections. There are many cover, there are many crops to choose from depending on your location. There are nitrogen fixing and non-nitrogen fixing cover crops. 
the nitrogen fixing cover crops are also known as legumes, um, have the unique ability to ex extract nitrogen from the air or atmosphere um, and transfer it to their roots for later use by plants and microbes. Oh, I, because I've done this in every class, I'm just gonna do it here because right now, well, I'm just gonna do it here. Um, the way that I've been describing this for people who don't know or are not familiar is that the way that, the way that this nitrogen fixing occurs is that there are symbiotic bacteria that live on nodules of the roots of these plants. Um, they hang out in these sort of little knuckle areas, like if my fingers were to be roots. And so what they do is they live symbiotically. From what I understand, plant, the plants exchange calcium and other nutrients with, the, with, the, uh, with those bacteria like rhizobia. And then the, the or those bacteria store nitrogen within those nodules. Um, later, as I'll talk about, when you disrupt the ecology, meaning kill the plants, then those bacteria also die and then that nitrogen is released into the soil. So that's how we're fixing nitrogen into the soil. So depending on the location, we have many cover crops to choose from. There are cool season and warm season cover crops. Cool season cover crops are the ones that you plant in the fall and don't touch again until the following spring. That includes, excuse me, oats, cereal rye, crimson clover, and field peas are the best ones for the mid-Atlantic region. Warm season cover crops include buckwheat, cowpeas, sorghum sedan grass hybrids, and yellow sweet blossom clover. We're going to examine all of those in detail. So cool season cover crops, oats, here we go. We, they plant them in the fall or in the fall after the cash crop harvest and they'll winter kill. The, after they die because of the temperatures, these residues here, once they just fall over, will outcompete the winter weeds. And then when the, temperatures heat up, the soil heats up again, the residues decomposing in the spring will suppress weed germination for a few weeks, meaning that you can plant directly into those in those few weeks of suppressed weed germination. Um, and these have a great soil tolerance. I've told previous classes that you can go see, well, <laughs> this was last summer. So I, you know, there is a hotel in on the waterfront downtown in Southwest um, that has oats as a sort of ornamental crop. You know, I was, I was driving by and I was like, whoa, you know, what's that? I didn't recognize that. Most people only recognize oats as, you know, through the, the, the logo or of the uh, Quaker oat guy, but you know, they're actually plant and they look like this and those, those are rolled oats, but you can go and see them real life down there. And that I've been saying is a example of the great soil tolerance because Southwest doesn't have really good soil like that. Southwest DC. All right, next. Cereal rye, here's a picture of the cereal rye. Cereal rye will scavenge nutrients after the cash crop. They'll suppress weed germination after reincorporation into the soil. Their deep fibrous roots work to alleviate compacted soils and they can be planted later in the year. Um, these say, I think, let's say that these are about four feet tall with some of these plants, it's generally like a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of how, how these, the potential for their roots to grow down. So as it's growing up that tall, it's also growing down that deep. And so that's what we're talking about, alleviating compacted soils in that way. That as soon as the roots grow down into the soil, especially into those clay layers, they'll, they'll you, and then you sort of reincorporate them you, you know, mow them down or something like that, those roots will die, but the space that they left will become a vacuum because mother nature abhors a vacuum. What'll happen is that, you know, um, worms might come and eat them or other bacteria might, well, bacteria, other microbial life will come and uh, decompose and digest those roots or the weeds will just dry up and then it'll leave a, a cavern um, all the way, or a tunnel rather, all the way from the surface of the, of the soil, all the way down to wherever they go. And as that happens, water comes down, other nutrients will come down and we'll start building soil below. All right, so as we talked about before with user, here we got crimson clover. Ooh, 
it's not quite the cool season yet, so you might want to wait, like we talked about earlier, until the temperatures stop hitting the 90s. But crimson clover here, very pretty, fixes nitrogen in the soil, lowers soil surface temperatures because it's covering and because of the thick mulch that it will produce. These beautiful flowers not only attract us, but pollinators and beneficial insects. And because of the thick mulch and biomass, it will build soil as it decomposes. The roots will increase the ability for the soil to tolerate erosion, and it will improve the water infiltration, like I said before, with the roots giving all these channels for water to go in. Um, with what I've been reading and what I've been learning recently, as I've told previous classes, is that this is probably about the right time to cut down the uh, the crimson clover. If it was like this in the in the springtime, that would be the best time. Mow it down, take your spade and put it, work it into the soil. Because at that point in time, then where we see like this is about, you know, I mean, it's getting there, but rough, like we can say maybe in a couple of days or so, once this flower stalk is looking to be about 50% in bloom, um, that's where you want to, that's when you would want to mow everything down because that's when the nitrogen concentrations are the highest within the nodules of those bacteria. Um, and so once you do that, then those bacteria will die and the maximum amount of nitrogen will be released into the soil. Now, all of us are learning here and we're not commodity growing, um, but that may be important to market gardeners, um, market farmers who are trying to get the most efficacy out of, uh, or most productivity out of their plots. So we don't want to, we don't want to pull it out because that will disrupt the entire nitrogen fixing process. So a user asked, crimson clover roots are very shallow. Clover can be pulled out or should it? And so I would say no, because you want, that's all of where the roots are is where the nitrogen that has been fixed is. So what you want to do is just mow it and then mow it and then mow it. And after a couple of mows down, the, the roots will be exhausted, the plant will be exhausted and it won't come back. But you don't want to pull it up unless, uh, you don't want to pull it up. Even, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. If you, if, you, if you did want to pull it up, I would just move it to somewhere else, like a garden path or something like that, because something like that you don't want to get rid of because of all the different benefits that, that the clover can have. Hmm. Um, well, if you, I would, I would plant into it. So she asked, uh, or the user asked, can you plant into it? I would plant into clover after you mowed it. You wouldn't want to plant into it at this point in time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, just like, just like I talked about with, with, with cutting it down and stuff like that. I mean, transplanting just as moving is as traumatic as it is for for us you know moving is one of the most stressful things that we can do it's even more for plants because they're not a mobile species or even kingdom right i think or domain yeah i you know sorry that's that's a little bit maybe a little bit too too classical science so another cool season cover crop here are field peas um another legume nitrogen fixing they're quickly available source of nitrogen after re incorporation into the soil after full bloom, like I was talking about before. This very dense picture shows perfectly the large amount of biomass that they have. They are very moisture efficient, which is good because you don't want to be using all the water all the time. And they have a long blooming period for pollinators. All these things, all these nitrogen fixing crops, you want to take, you want to take them down like after they bloom, but you know, if you start seeing seed pods like that, take them up because you, you know, you, it's not that you don't want to grow them, but you can also grow your own cover crops. Everything will adapt to your soils and stuff like that. But you want to take them down before, um, before they start really producing seeds like that. All right, so warm season cover crops. Um, buckwheat here, it's quick growth can suppress weeds. It's got a very long flowering period. After three weeks of growth, and then we'll bloom more for another 10 more weeks, which is the entire summer. Um, it will sequester phosphorus and make it more available for the next crop and has very low moisture usage. Um, 
I previously stated before. Oh, she uh, user asks, I have peas self germinating under wood chips. Is it worth moving them? I don't I mean, I don't know. That's that's up to you. I mean, it like like we like we talked about before, you can just you can just cut them down. Um, and uh, if you want to just cut them, snip them right at the uh, where they're emerging from the wood chips. You know, it, it, I guess I don't know why you're asking, is it worth moving them? Um, that, that probably is a better question to ask. Um, what I've told people before is that uh, with the, um, yeah, absolutely. Buckwheat attracts bees. That's what, yeah, I should have, that's exactly what we're talking about here with this long flowering period. Um, that the, that all sorts of beneficial things will come, whether it's honeybees, native bees, um, and then um, other, other like beneficial uh, bugs like ladybugs and stuff like that. And especially my favorite, which are um, predatory insects like parasitoid wasps and stuff like that will come and feed on the, uh, the nectar before they start feeding on something like a tomato hornworm. Oh my gosh. All right, so a warm, another warm season cover crop. Here we have cowpeas, another legume. Uh, excellent sources of, of fall nitrogen when summer planted, like we talked about. You cut them down and then you have that nitrogen available to you in the fall. Um, if you wanna plant something like, like those brassicas and, you need, and, you, and they need a quick boost. The extra floral nectaries that they have will attract beneficial insects, meaning they have even more nectar than most flowers do. Um, and they thrive in high heat. This soil around here in this corner here looks pretty dry, and I would attribute that to <laughs> some of that heat. And if I am correct, then this explosive growth is because of that. Um, and they, and despite that, they use uh, low soil moisture usage in comparison to to other other cover crops, which is exactly what you need in the in the summertime in the warm season. Um, and then, user, if you have if you've been having, or having, having had luck in the past with transplanting peas, then go for it. Dig them out, and then you know, and put them where you want them to go. All right. So another warm season cover crop: sorghum Sudan grass hybrids. Sorghum Sudan grass has allelopathic nematodicidal and uh, herbicidal effects. The deep root system penetrates and breaks up compacted soils. They build soil by building uh, by increasing soil biomass, and they have a wide pH uh, a pH range for the soil. Um, just to uh, just to sort of explain, I'll get to the questions that um, that uh, user and the things that uh, Sharon and the user have talked about in just a little bit. Um, allelopathy can be a little bit of a uh, kind of complicated topic, so this means like. Um, uh, killing of the other or something like that. Um, and uh, what, what, what sorghum Sudan grass hybrids do is that they secrete compounds in the soil that prevent germination of other plants. So around sorghum Sudan grass, you're likely only really going to see sorghum Sudan grass thriving because they, are the only, they, they sort of make it toxic for other plants to grow. Same thing with the nematodicidal compounds, they make it toxic for the nematodes to be there. And then, like I said before, with preventing the germination, they can be also considered herbicidal, especially when these things are incorporated into the soil. They do a lot of that once the, once the plant has been killed, then they have these compounds within, their, within the plant's body. Um, and then they, uh, they will sort of exude that into the soil after they were to die. Um, I'm not sure if the sorghum Sudan grass is something that you want to eat. It may be edible, but I'm not sure if it's going to be delectable. Um, I think, I don't, I don't know exactly what the natural process was in, in creating the sorghum Sudan grass hybrid. Um, uh, but you could probably eat it, but I I'm don't think it sure would you be, can. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't think that it would be as delicious as consuming sorghum. <laughs> like regular sort of though. Um, it might be like like trying to eat dent corn 
as sweet corn. Um, you know, it's like, it's not going to be the same or trying to eat popping corn as sweet corn. It's, it's corn, but it's not the same corn. Um, I, I think uh, I have a book on African grains and it's in there, you know, something to look into. Yeah, absolutely. I had a, I had a book that I, I had learned about, um, a lot of the, um, the different ones like Tef and, um, yes. Tef and Fonio and, 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 and different things like that. And I mean, really it depends the edib their edibility depends on how good of a cook you are. <laughs> um, yeah, and how because, much rinsing you want to do and, and preparation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Sharon asks, I tried growing sorghum Sudan grass one year, but it didn't grow much about one foot, but not taller. Was the soil depleted of something for its growth? Quite possibly, you know, um, in other classes, I didn't say it last time, but like, um, in other classes, I've talked about the necessity for soil testing. Um, it could be the case that the soil may have been just too tough. I mean, like these, these plants. All right. So, you know, right currently I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we were walking through the, walking through um, one of these parts, Crowder's Mountain. The amount of topsoil that was present on that mountain where near the path was ridiculous. It was maybe like, an eighth of an inch before it was some serious clay underneath. Um, and, you know, it's, it was kind of crazy because there was a lot of, a lot of pines, cedars, um, or not cedars, but a lot of like hemlocks and stuff like that. Um, and those things can make it work, but there wasn't a lot of undergrowth. There are a lot of mushrooms and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of decomposition. But what I'm saying is, is that it could be where, wherever you planted it, that, um, that uh, the soil may be a little bit tougher than you thought um, initially. So, I mean, like I said, possibly it is not, I mean, it is a very plausible thing. It's kind of hard to say whether or not um, without sort of having seen the plant or doing a sort of um, for, <laughs> like a soil forensics um, or just sort of knowing what, what your, uh, what your um what your garden was like um before a user i didn't address this user said with all the rain we're seeing mushrooms sprouting in the lawns and the wood chips should we remove them or let them be i say keep them um uh because um you know i'm i'm of a very particular school of you know natural regenerative ag agricultural thought as the mushrooms are breaking down the things in the soil, they are freeing nutrients and making them bioavailable in the soil. That is my um, particular opinion. Not, maybe not of, I'm not saying that UDC is saying that, I'm saying Mason Trapio as a individual entity is saying that. Um, I've been seeing a lot of those fairy rings of, of various amanitas and um, seeing a lot of those things is very awesome to see. I really like it. Um, I would just say don't, eat them, you know, um, and I'll speak on behalf of the university also, do not eat any random mushrooms that are growing in your soil. Um, but I would keep them because what it's showing you is that the soil is very much alive. All right, warm season cover crops, yellow sweet blossom clover. Yellow sweet blossom clover has an excellent nitrogen fixation ability it has a deep root system up to five feet in some cases. It has, produces a large amount of biomass, which is good for producing that thick mulch that we talked about earlier. And it attracts pollinators and beneficial insects, just like this choice picture here of this honeybee. Oh, keep clicking on the wrong thing. So we have some climate change growing tips. Here are some growing tips which can help the urban growers better address problems associated with climate change. We first, we want to match our cover crop to the season and to the climate, knowing your USDA zones will be imperative to this. We want to grow legumes to increase soil nitrogen levels. You also need to inoculate those legumes. You can either do this by, oh my gosh, um, oh, never mind. You can do this 
buy having pre-inoculated seeds or you can buy inoculant, mist seeds with water and you can sprinkle the inoculant powder. Um, let me know if that needs to be clarified. Um, well, I'll just clarify it just in case because I'll be sending this out later. So the inoculant is the bacteria, right? And you need that so that you can have the nitrogen fixing ability of the cover crops. Because like I said before, it's not that clover fixes nitrogen, but it's the bacteria that lives on the clover and in some aspects within the clover that fixes the nitrogen. Every now and then you might be able to find clover, as I did in the past, that already has the rhizobium or the other nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria present in the soil. And something like that is sort of pre-inoculated. So you could dig those up and transfer them and, and they would grow. But what you want to be able to do to be as efficient as possible, you want to be able to buy pre-inoculated seeds um, that already are coated with, with the bacteria, or like we said before, buy the inoculant, um, spread the seeds out, mix the seeds with water, you know, get them, get them a little bit wet, and then you can sprinkle an inoculant powder in them, get them evenly coated so that when they grow, the seed head pops. As they pop through, the bacteria coats the, uh, the, the roots, and as they grow, everybody grows. So the last tip is that we want to cut the cover crops down into very small pieces. Two of the most important valuable tools that I use to manage cover crops are flat-edged garden spade and a battery-operated hedge trimmer. Oh, somebody's here. My bad. Um, uh, and a battery-operated hedge trimmer. These small pieces break down quicker. So before, you know, you want, you want to be able to work these things into the soil, not necessarily till. That's not my, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody tilling. Um, welcome, uh, Ab Abdisamad. Let me know if I'm pronouncing that absolutely incorrectly and let me know how to pronounce your name. Welcome to the class and I'm excited to have you. Um, but I'm- Okay, uh, thank you so much, welcome. thank you so much, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you just arrived just in time for uh, the the summary of what we just talked about. Um, I've had to turn it over to terminate it. How low? Oh, sorry. I've cut down ryegrass. Oh. Oh, um, I just got to notice that my internet connection was unstable. Um, um, okay. I've cut down ryegrass. It will grow back. I've had to turn it over to terminate it. How low should it be cut down? That's a very interesting question. Um, and like, I, I, I would say that it would be the same as, um, as the, uh, like something like, like the clover where you may have to mow it twice or mow it even lower. You need to make sure that you're cutting below where the meristem is. Maybe in the past when, you, when you've cut it um, the maris, you cut slightly above the meristem. And so it was just like, cool. It was just like growing hair, you know, where the plant was, you know, say, say the meristem is at my elbow and you cut it off here at the forearm, then it's just going to grow back from the elbow. But you may have to cut, you may have to mow it down a little bit further um, than you thought. Um, so that may be one thing. But I also know that in a, in a commodity agriculture capacity, what they do with ryegrass is that they they run it over with this thing called a roller crimper and so it's like a steamroller but it has blades on the end of it and so as at what happens is that the the the, the tractor will run through the through the plot and that the uh the roller crimper will m turn them over and then chop up the uh chop or crimp the stalk at various places and so it is injuring the plant at the same time as it's knocking it over. And that way it would it like just completely exhaust the plant, um, the plant's uh, like sugar reserves and everything like that to sort of uh, kill the plant and have it decompose as quickly as possible. So in summary, um, we have uh, carbon dioxide gases are on the rise. These are good for the crops and the weeds. 
We have to grow cover crops to suppress weeds and, carbon and lower carbon dioxide concentrations. And we want to choose our cover crops depending on the location. Um, and we want to choose a mix of nitrogen fixing and non-nitrogen fixing crops. From uh, this podcast I was listening to, I think it was Cover Crop, cover crop Podcast, um, or it was a no-till podcast. Um, those are the names of these things, but they're, you know, these are, these are commodity agriculture podcasts. Um, and by commodity agriculture, what I mean is that these are people growing um, like wheat for flour and stuff like that, or corn, they're growing corn, wheat, or soybeans. Those are the th three commodity crops that I'm referring to when I say commodity agriculture. What these guys were talking about is that they were seeing that there wasn't it is the best to have a mix of cover crops and varying up the species, but there really isn't a difference in species and in, in benefits to the soil and to the uh, viability and the biological activity of the soil past like eight different species of things growing. Now, a lot of what these commodity agriculture dudes do is also grow all these cover crops as supplemental feed for their cows. Um, at the same time, so the cows eat and then defecate and then, you know, everything is really active, but they weren't seeing, a, uh, you know, so having like a 16 seed cover crop mix, you know, is just going to be spending more money than you need to. You just buy twice as much of the eight uh, cover crop seed mix. All right. Oh, so any, are there any further questions? Um, oh, wow. Oh. Many of them terminate the cover crop with glyphosate. Absolutely. Um, and that was something that uh, <laughs> I didn't learn until um, maybe like a year or so ago that I realized that without, um, you know, without glyphosate, without Monsanto, <laughs> um, a lot of this very interesting regenerative agriculture um, stuff wouldn't have been possible. But the evolution and technology, especially of the roller crimper, really changed the game and it really made a lot of organic cover cropping and organic no-till possible. Prior to that, no-till was known as a beneficial practice, but it needed the needed glyphosate or another heavy-duty pesticide like that um, or another heavy-duty herbicide to be able to, um, to, uh, to make it possible. And yes, those shells are full of Roundup. I remember when we were growing seeds down by Howard University, where we were growing, we were growing a plot down by Howard University um, in somebody's backyard. We were talking about all the different things that are there and what we needed to be able to do and how we we're gonna do this without any um, chemicals. And then we come outside and somebody else that's in the alley is spraying um, some, uh, um, spraying something with, uh, with, with Roundup. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for digitally traveling so far. Um, it, it really is an honor to have you here all the way from Mogadishu. Seems hot weather has helped with its termination in comparison to cooler temperatures to help decompose the residue. Sometimes you can wait until the late spring, early summer, if you want to plant various types of spring crops. Absolutely. The hotter weather is going to increase biological activity. Like they say with compost, you need to take it all the way up to like 140 degrees, or 140 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that in order for the microbial activity to be um, absolutely uh, to be working for you. But that's a whole nother conversation. But yes, you know, the increased temperature always increases activity. We know this, you know, the temperature of the universe is, I think, like three degrees Kelvin or three Kelvin. Sorry, no degrees with Kelvin. Um, but, uh, you know, at zero Kelvin is obviously nothing is going on, but it's crazy. You know, imagine if things were at like five Kelvin, I'll be crazy. <laughs> All right. Part two, insect ecology, plant disease and climate change. So insects are cold blooded, thus their behavior is related to temperature. So how will the warmer climate and more extreme temperatures affect the urban agriculturalist and crop production? Definitive answers are elusive, but there is some research that might give general guidelines for what we might 
expect as the urban environment warms. One of the first signs of a rapidly warming climate is the number of inner insect generations in season. The warmer it gets, the faster insects develop and breed. As winter cold can keep insects in check, warming winters may be beneficial to insect survival. Warming winters, for example, are a key factor in the survival and destructive impact of pine bark beetles throughout North America. This is moving their habitat northward. Oh, sorry. Also, <laughs> insects will shift their habitat northward, and there are some indications that plant characteristics can change. The effects of rising carbon dioxide concentrations um, can have on reducing plant protein can result in greater feeding rates by insects to obtain, obtain the necessary protein. Carbon dioxide changes could cause changes in leaf thickness and reduce infestation of leaf sucking insects, although not in every case. Also, carbon dioxide could reduce the ability of a plant to produce defensive compounds that keep insects at bay. Insect and plant interactions are very complex. You would need a crystal ball to make specific predictions for specific crops. It would be equally foolish to ignore the consequences of those interactions in an era of high carbon dioxide and the very erratic climate that we now have. Pla also, plant diseases will be on the rise due to an unpredictable climate. Hot and wet conditions, which are expected in some areas, are the perfect combination for disease development in many crops. For example, Mild winters and warm weather are associated with increases in potato blight, powdery mildew, leaf spot disease, leaf rust, leaf rust, and other soil-borne root diseases. Mason, is there any good news? Yes, plants might build resistance by defensively closing their, their plant pores to disease-carrying fungal spores. The rise in carbon dioxide may improve plant water loss by closing some of the plant pores, which could moderate leaf moisture evaporation. We have always relied on mainly three resources for insect and disease management. The first is Rodale's Color Handbook of Garden Insects. The second is Rodale's Ultimate Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. And of course, our imagination. To fully utilize our imagination requires knowing pests and plant diseases intuitively. Climate smart crops. For our 2019-2020 Farmer to Farmer National Institute of Food and Agriculture grant, in collaboration with Tuskegee University, we chose to look at specific varietal selections of heat tolerant crops. Uh, we looked at leafy green and fruiting crops that were sure to produce under consistent high summer temperatures. The specific crops that were chosen were, um, oh, uh, were, well, I'll get it, I'll show you. Um, well, I'll show you, I'll just show you in the next slide rather than reading them twice. So we, of course, and then after this, this will give you an ability to find more online. All right, so the specific crops that we tested were fruiting and vegetable crops, tomatoes, sweet and hot peppers, cucumbers and melons, eggplant, green and lima beans, squash, corn, sweet potato, okra. And then for our leafy greens, which uh, we found some specific varieties of lettuce, mustard green, Malabar spinach, and New Zealand spinach, and purslane. Excuse me. So let's go on. Tomatoes, we need to look for heat set varieties. Some tomatoes don't fruit after the temperature reaches the 90 degree mark. So look for heat set varieties, so, like Super Sweet 100, pictured here as a cherry tomato, Solar Set, Surefire, Oregon Spring, and Oregon Star. You know, if you want to, screenshot this slide in the next couple slides, or if you can wait, um, there will be later uh, a fact sheet with basically everything that I've already said, um, separate from the things that I added. Um, None of these are heirloom tomatoes. Uh, these are specifically bred tomatoes, not engineered, but bred tomatoes. Um, some of these, like uh, some of these, like some of the ones that we'll talk about later, um, were found at various extension places 
Um, and so maybe those can be considered, but uh, like, I think when you're talking about heirloom, you're talking about in the way that like, like Baker Creek seeds might offer or something like that. Um, and some of these, so you may be able to find heat set varieties within those. Um, but what I would recommend for heirloom crops that you want that are uh, adapted, I would start looking for plants. I would start by looking for um, looking say somewhere. Uh, yes, I will definitely. I will definitely share it. Let me write. Let me write your email down. Let's see, this is a R W A C one o three. Yes, uh, Abdi Samad, I will. I will. I will send. I will send that to you. Um, so, sorry, what I, what I would say, Sharon, would be to go on Baker Creek, um, rareseeds.com. This is, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, just, I just compiled these from and found some pictures, but I guess the Super Sweet 100 may get as the temperatures approach 100. What I would say if you were looking for heirloom tomatoes would be to look um, on somewhere where the sites have reviews and I generally those places that have reviews will also have a location in the review. And so I would look for somebody that is giving a review from say Arizona um, or, or uh, lower Arizona, Nevada, um, Southern California. Um, and if they're having success, you know, um, then you're, you're more likely to have them, especially anywhere on the East Coast. Or if you find somebody down in Alabama um, uh, or some, some, you know, in the deep south where the temperatures are getting really, really hot. And if they're still fruiting, you want to get, you, you want to try and find that person and get some of those seeds or find where, find out where they bought those seeds. Many peppers don't have a heat set gene. Hot peppers are genetically closer to their wild pepper heritage. Um, but some varieties that they tested were Cubanelle, um, Gypsy, gator peppers, beady peppers, and sweet banana peppers. This right here are the Cubanelle peppers. If you're growing hot peppers, you don't have to worry about the heat. Um, even hot peppers love the heat because when it's, when it's hot and then the soil dries out or whatever, they, they start showing their wilt or whatever, they start producing more of the capsaicin compounds and they you know, produce a more desirable product, in my opinion. Corn is thought of as a tasty, traditional summer treat that is perfect to grow in the midsummer heat. But some varieties of corn do not pollinate well when the temperatures surpass the mid 90s, especially in hot, dry areas. The pollen dries out and you're filled and you get poorly filled ears of corn. Watering helps, but it's not the solution. Uh, I, um, so some of the varieties are Lancelot and Breeder's Choice pictured. I think uh, this is the Breeder's Choice pictured here. Um, the Urban Farmer podcast, uh, I, the guy's first name is Greg. Um, I forget his last name, but he is in Phoenix or in the greater Phoenix metropolitan area. And they talk about growing corn in Phoenix. What they do is they get up early in the morning before the temperatures hit the mid 90s. They take the tassel which is the pollen producing part of the, of the corn, and then they'll rub it on the silk. So if you look here, this is the part of the, part of the silk where they would rub the tassel on, and the pollen will travel all the way down the silk to each individual kernel, and you'll get a full ear of corn. They do that with their heirloom corns, by the way, like the, um, like the uh, glass bead or something like that. Um, they, they, uh, they have had a lot of success doing that, not only in Phoenix, but also in places like Denver, where, where the, you know, growing, growing at that altitude, things change considerably um, because, you know, plants aren't used, but they're having success all over the place by these more manual methods. Cucumbers and melons. What happens to cucumbers and melons during a very hot and humid summer? The plant produces some fruit, but the heat and the long days cause the plants to form too many male flowers, which do not produce fruit. You need to look for heat tolerant and disease resistant varieties like the Mark Moore 86 cucumber. 
the salad bush cucumber, planter's jumbo melon, the pictured ambrosia melon, and the Edisto 47. I want to show you guys something because I'm very proud of this. Hold on just a second. <laughs> this right here is my big boy or big girl. It doesn't matter as the seeds don't have a gender necessarily uh, or fruits don't. But um, this is, uh, you know, I was pretty pleased to, uh, to get, this, get, the, get this because I grew this from a grocery store butternut squash that I bought um, in 2017. And I planted it and I got this one and a couple other ones, but this one um, I've been growing or I've been, I haven't done anything with because I was just sort of too proud, you know? Uh, it was just uh, something just like a, like a, uh, um, a trophy for me and a validation of my own <laughs> practices and beliefs, you know? So next time you get something, you know, when we, when we grow these sorts of crops, um, you know, they, they're growing to be eaten, right? But what happens is that the best crops generally don't, the genetic material doesn't survive, right? Now, I don't know what's going on inside of here with regards to the seeds or not, but what I am saying is, is that whenever you do eat something that is, I mean, just particularly good, you have to be able to save those seeds because what, what, what we're kind of doing is producing a sort of negative, um, a negative selection at the same time because we'll, we'll get a tomato and you'd be like, oh my gosh, so juicy, so delicious, so, so flavorful, but then the seeds go in the trash, right? And so we don't, we don't cultivate that same thing. You know, we'll produce, a, we'll produce a fruit that looks extremely good, but then the rest of the ones that are grown, who knows what the genetic material is, who knows what the nutrient av availability is, who knows, but if you get something that looks good, tastes good, feels good, make sure you save those seeds and keep those things growing. I'm gonna put this back. All right, we're almost done. I know we're over time a little bit, but um, everybody seems to be enjoying themselves. So we're just gonna keep going. Um, like I said, we're almost done. Uh, only like two more slides. Leafy greens. So I didn't wanna find pictures for all these um, because uh, some of these, the varieties don't matter. So there are a few nutritious leafy greens that can be grown in the high heat um, days of summer, but Many varieties of lettuce do not thrive under high temperatures and long sunny days. Balting occurs when lettuce flowers prematurely. That condition is caused mainly by, mainly by the long sunlit days of summer rather than high temperatures. A little shading of the lettuce helps to remediate, uh, remedy that situation. There are a few slow bolt varieties on the market. Um, and so you wanna, you wanna look for those. Um, Swiss chard is a is a is a is another one that we can grow. Um, user was asking earlier about things that we can grow in the fall. You, Swiss chard grows well in hot or cold weather. Um, just watch out for those uh, oxalates. Um, and then uh, Asian mustard greens do very well under high high temperatures. New Zealand spinach and I should have added Malabar spinach also, um, but just with New Zealand spinach. Uh, contains a large concentration of high omega-3s. However, it is an acquired taste, but it grows very well in high heat. And Malabar spinach is the same way. I'm, I'm not sure about its nutrient content. I know that people in India, southern India, really eat a lot of it, um, but it, it's kind of slimy a little bit like, um, like okra can be. So like, like they said with New Zealand spinach, it, has, it is an acquired taste. <laughs> and so um, lastly here we have amaranth. It grows like a weed and is consumed throughout the tropics, especially in the Caribbean, where it's called callaloo. Um, you can see wild varieties of, of, the, uh, of amaranth and it's called pigweed. Um, it, get, it gets really tall. And um, no, oh, maybe, hold on. Uh, well, never mind. I used to, um, Last year, we had a lot of amaranth growing in the plot that we had, and I let the, I let the amaranth grow 
Uh, I'm 5'11", so it got to be about my height, and then I cut it down at the base. And then I had to just do the maintenance that, you know, I'm saying, and watch out for offshoots from the stalk. But what I did is that I took that and then cut all of the branches off. And I saved it because now I have a pole for trellising. And I'd used it for propping up my Monstera. Um, but the Monstera got too heavy and it broke. I'll show you the Monstera now. Here's my Monstera in the corner. That new leaf here is, is brand new. I'm very proud. Anyway, um, so um, those, are, those, are the, those are the plants that we recommend. And of course, I'll be sending this out to everybody. And amaranth, like corn and some other plants, is a C4 carbon fixating plant. Um, which means that the hotter the temperature is, the more it'll grow, which is really good, especially if you're trying to get leaves off of it. This is, there are two main varieties of amaranth that are consumed. There's a leaf amaranth, and then there's a grain amaranth. I grew the grain amaranth and consumed the seeds, or and consumed the leaves, but it didn't produce as much leaves as a leaf amaranth would. So I would say that you want to look for the amaranths. If you're interested in growing amaranth, you, you should look for the amaranths that are also called callaloo in that, in that way. Um, and they kind of taste like a, a sort of gamey <laughs> spinach, if, you, if, if that makes sense, because it's, it's wild. So other climate smart crops. Here we have the uh, green beans. We have Romano and Macasian. For lima beans, sieva and the Florida butter beans, almost any variety of okra will grow well in, in, this, um, in this new normal that we're describing. The Thai long green eggplant will grow very well, and the varieties Beauregard and Vardaman of the sweet potato will also grow very well. And as we know, you can also, as I found out last year, you can also eat the greens of the sweet potato. They're supposed to be very nutritious. So if you, if you also need some more leafy greens, consider sweet potato greens. They can be um, grown like in a, or they can be eaten like collards. Um, so here are the references. And to start off the questions, I will, um, I will uh, just answer, talk about what um, Sharon was talking about just now. She said, I received, pumpkin seedling from a gardener. It was very sweet and produced 30 pumpkins. I saved the seeds, but next year's seeds um, uh, wouldn't grow. Could the genetics have been modified? Um, yeah, sweet potato greens taste sweet, cooks down like spinach. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I, 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 um, I really look forward to doing that. Um, it's all good. Um, I will, uh, I will be sending the, uh, the presentation out um later so there's there's no worries um, um so could the seed genetics have been modified well technically anytime we grow as we understand as i understand epigenetics to be the case anytime that we grow we are modifying we're modifying our genetics um, um whether it's in our thought or in our agricultural practices you know every year the plant is adapting um to the Every year, it is adapting to its current situation, and so um, it's genetically modifying based <laughs> on what everything that happened to it. So it adapts and then exactly. produces seed. Exactly, and so yeah. in your in your in your case, Sharon, you know when people sell things for seed, you have to have a really high threshold for. Um, uh, when, when you, for, for selling them, I think it, and, and, and those thresholds change depending on the crop. And so um, with your circumstance, there, I mean, just like we talked about earlier, there, there are, there's a whole list of potential issues that could have happened, whether it was planting depth, time, soil moisture, light, soil temperature, um, nematode populations, you know, something suppressing them. If you had the seed and it looked like it popped, but it, but um, meaning, you know, it started germinating and then died, that's something. If it never germinated, that's something else. Um, 
whether or not the seeds were even ready to do so, whether or not the seeds didn't grow um, or, 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 act, or, or are ready to grow, you know, just as humans have stillbirths, something like that could have been the case. The, the seed itself could have started growing and then a, and aborted itself. There are many different way, reasons why the seeds wouldn't have grown. But I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, that, um, that it was because of where you grew them that they, 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 they didn't grow. That would be, that is, um, that to me, the only way I can think about it is that is that's taking a bridge, a step towards a more metaphysical <laughs> agricultural thing by saying like, hmm, maybe this pumpkin like grew here, but uh, it, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't want to grow the next year. Sorry, some germination, but when placed in the soil, it wouldn't continue their growth. It's been a couple years now. So <laughs> I'm just going to continue on with the metaphysical thing. I would then see if that would be the case with other um, cucurbits. You know, if you're not having luck with those in that, in that same plot, then it just may not be the case. And you might want to rotate some things growing on in that place. But it sounds like uh, Linda has something to say. Um, I maybe may have read that wrong though. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's no, no, oh. it, yeah, you covered everything that it's probably it could have been immature seed. It is all those things you listed. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I would just try and, um, and rotate some crops through there that sort of get further away from the cur cucurbit um, family and then try it again in a couple of years, unfortunately. Or do something where you, um, you can grow some of these, you just get, you know, you get a, like a big pot, like ones that they have in like restaurants for trees or something like that. And then you, you transplant your, um, you, your, uh, your squash into there and uh, immediately set it up for um, upward trellising and just, you know, top dress with compost, make some compost tea and feed the mess out of that thing. That's what I would recommend if, you know, if you really want to, if you really want to test this, um, because it, because if it is a, if it, it may be an issue of transplantation or something like that. And so you can take some of the soil and test it um, in that way. I had started, um, I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately. I don't have a picture of it that I can readily find um, right now, but I started um, some squash seeds. That that squash that I just showed you all, um, I started that in a solo cup. Um, uh, you know, I just cut like push, poke three holes in the bottom. You know, poke three holes in the bottom of it and put some soil amended with perlite in there, and and you know just put the seed. I put a couple seeds in there, and I just was like you know, whatever happens, happens. And, um, and then I, I think, you know, I kept those, I kept that in there for a while. And then I transferred it to in the ground, I think. Yeah, I, then I put it in the ground um, into a prepared bed. Uh, but um, I would say, and then this year, I, I, you know, I had some or this yeah earlier this summer, well, this was last summer. I had some growing in um, in my compost bin, <laughs> but you know, I, I you know, I, I enjoyed the growth. I had uh, tomatoes growing out of there, a mulberry tree growing out of there, and some um, squash growing out of there. But you know, I didn't know this until um, this year. Just like just like we experienced, um, yeah, I had too many male flowers. I only had male flowers. And I didn't know that it was, I thought that it was some weird mineral thing. Like I wasn't, I wasn't providing the plants with everything that they needed to grow. Self-esteem was lowering. I didn't know that it was just a environmental thing. You know, like we talked about in the very beginning of class, mother nature always bats last. And although I really appreciated the sight of the, of, of the, um, of the, uh, of the squash, um, the compost bin uh, really wasn't a place for it. Um, and I really, I was, so anyway, that's that. Um, I think I'm, I think I'm just rambling because I'm, I'm a little bit caffeinated. 
Um, user asks, what can we do with all this rain? It's ruining many crops that have to be ditched. Just fo focus on fall growing now. Yeah, that's tough. Um, you know, uh, yeah, because a lot of this is ruined. I mean, the soil is already saturated, saturated, so many things are being flooded out. And it, it is kind of attributed to the exact same thing I was talking about last, um, just, just now, where Mother Nature <laughs> is batting last again. I remember um, a couple years ago, what was it, last year, actually, we had these same end of the end of the year, end of the growing year rains that we're having right now. We had those in the beginning last year. Um, and uh, um, oh, I have a book. I have a book on this. Where is that book? Um, we had, we had those things and, and a lot of farmers, um, a lot of these commodity farmers were, were getting trounced by this rain. And that is something where um, crop insurance would come in, come into the place. So yeah, I would, I would focus on, on fall crops, um, you know, and, and just sort of learning from your experience and seeing what's really thriving, if anything is at all. Um, and learning from, like taking a sort of meta analysis of what your, or a higher level analysis rather, of what your plots are looking like and thinking about how you may be able to improve drainage, um, where within your plot does it seem that things may be a little bit higher or lower. Um, just looking at, at your plot as a larger ecosystem and seeing how you can help it in the future. Um, Sharon says, nut sedge has been concerned after weeks of heavy rain and weeded areas, but it's hard to get up the nuts and more will grow. What's the best way to management? Are soil deficiencies allowing its rapid growth or is mainly a sign of a wet environment? Ah, uh, if I had the answer to this, <laughs> I would have a lot of money for, uh, because nut sedge is a really a problem this in the middle of the country. Um, I, there's a book, I'll type it in the chat. Um, there's a book by Rodale. I have a, I have a copy. Thank you, Linda. I really appreciate you being here and assisting and, uh, and validating and encouraging uh, me and everybody else that was here in the chat. Thank you, you did a great job. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have to answer that question because user user asked me that in the future. Um, but I'll, I'll get I'll get to that later. Um, uh, Weeds and why they grow is the name of that book. Um, that talks about a lot of that. Like that talk that talks about the first part of the answer your question, um, where it says the basically the thesis of the book is you balance the soil, you'll balance the weeds, meaning you may have a concentration of too much organic matter. And once you bring down the organic matter, then a certain weed will grow, go away. You may not have enough iron. And so, uh, or you may have too much iron. And, and once you sort of balance the soil, the, uh, the weed populations will go down. I, I'm trying to, oh, I know where it is. I'll be right back, I'll show you. This is another copy of the same book. It's called, oh, this is backwards. It's called Weeds Control Without Poisons. I'll type it in the chat. It's by uh, Charles Walters and it's published by Acres USA. Um, I'm gonna check the index real quick to see if it has anything about nuts edge. All right, see purple nuts edge and yellow nuts edge. Do you, is it, I'm gonna assume that it's yellow nuts edge cause that's what I've seen a lot of. Um, is, that, is that the case? Are the, is the little flower thing at the top yellow? Oh. 
Yeah, uh, that's very good info and reason. I weeded back of the plot for years and then decided to place soil over top of it. The soil seems to be better, seems to be a better when nut sedge wouldn't grow. It's yellow flowers. Um, all right, so I found the uh, thing, but I'm trying to find exactly what they say. And then <laughs> I'll, I'll just read what they have to say um, for the edification of everybody in the class. Um, there are four pages where this is, <laughs> um, where it's mentioned. Um, but I would definitely, I mean, absolutely recommend getting this book. Um, I was able to get it through the interlibrary loan. Um, so <laughs> you may not be able to get it, <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, uh, but I'll try and make more of these same concepts available, but I believe the book is like 20, 30 bucks, maybe, uh, an enormous value. Um, and sometimes it has really nice sketches of, uh, I really like this plant that tour is very pretty flowers smell like pepper, but it, it it's, it's, it was one of those things I was talking about before where it, um, it grows uh, because of the, um, a lot of organic matter in the soil. Um, okay, so this is, um, all right, just, I think I found, um, okay, so in this thing he's talking about, um, uh, grasses being a problem to row crop producers. So um, like, and then the very, one of the very last ones he says is yellow nutsedge cypress esculentis. He says, um, very basically as Dr. Kerry Reams instructed, sour grass weeds such as quat grass are indicative of calcium deficiencies, qualitatively, if not quantitatively. Broadleaf weeds, um, broadleaf weeds are indicative of an improper phosphate to potash ratio. Using the Lamott soil testing method, this ratio should be two pounds of phosphate to one pounds of potash for row crops and four pounds of phosphate to one, pat, one pound of potash for alfalfa and grass crops. Succulent type plants such as purslane are indicative of soils deficient in biologically active carbons. I don't know if that was helpful to you, but that is the sort of methodology and stuff that is given within this book um, where they're talking about how to amend the soils after, um, after you've discovered this thing. Um, I'll look on page 119 again is the next place where it was mentioned. Um, so I have it here. Now, the Acres USA catalog, I'm just going to let you know, it depends on how kind of esoteric you like things to be, because their entire publishing house is kind of based on um, this sort of like almost a spiritual nature of working with agriculture. Um, I am particularly partial to that sort of thing. But um, some of the stuff that they talk about is kind of counter to mainstream scientific thought. Um, so uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that once you start reading this thing and, and they start talking about um, Hieronymus Bosch and, and um, um, Rudolf Steiner and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, because they're talking about um, they're, they're talking about a bunch of different stuff here. So let me go because um, oh, so yeah, the next the next thing that they're talking about here was using a specific um, a specific uh, device that they call um, in a scientific method that they call radionics, and they were measuring the rate with uh which is sort of talking about its um general vitality hence its efficacy in predicting projecting negative or dying energy 
to the same weed in the field. So um, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little bit different. And so they have the thing here and then the radionic rate. I don't, I don't know necessarily what, what that's about. So I'm gonna go to the, um, the last place that it's mentioned. And of course, if anybody else has um, any other questions, then, then we can get to them. So the last page that it was mentioned is on page 240. And I think this is the part of the book that I really enjoyed the most, where it goes through each particular species and talks about uh, in a rough sort of scenario what what they actually are um but um 240 here we go all right yellow nut sedge this is what i was looking for the entire <laughs> the entire time found all over the united states in cultivated fields gardens grain fields rich or sandy soils yellow nut sedge cypress esculentis is a serious perennial weed it reproduces by seeds and weak thread-like stolons that end by hard tubers. Stems of this weed are tall, simple, and triangular in shape. The pale green leaves are three-ranked, about as long as the stem, with clothed, closed, oh my god, closed sheaves mostly at base. Yellow nut sedge produces spikelets 0.5 to 3 centimeters long and 1.5 to 3 millimeters wide that are yellow to golden brown, um, strongly flattened, mostly four-ranked, along the wide angle rachis blunt tip, uh, the tip acute surround. Appearance of yellow nut sedge, here we go. Appearance of yellow nut sedge indicates soils seriously out of sorts with very low levels of calcium and phosphate and very high levels of potassium and magnesium. I'll, um, I'll read that again. Appearance of nut, nut sedge indicates soils seriously out of sorts with very low levels of calcium and phosphate and very high levels of potassium and magnesium. Iron, sulfate, boron, selenium, salt, and aluminum levels are likely to be high. Soils are likely to have low humus and porosity, high moisture, anaerobic bacteria, and poor drainage and residual decay. So, in my opinion, that, um, oh, never mind. Never mind, I was wrong. So, let me know how, how much that, that, that worked for you, Sharon. Um, and of course, I've been recording this entire thing, so um, you'll be able to get access to, to, to that particular passage. Um, Later, I'm not sure about like typing it up and, and, and giving it out on behalf of the university or something like that. Um, but like I said, it can be found at Acres USA. Um, this is the, I think this is the second edition of this book. Um, it was published in 1991 and then again in 1996. Um, so uh, yeah. Um, if um, nobody else has any questions, and if Disa Mod, I will, I'll, I'll be, um, I'll be producing everything. I'll be sort of so like you came into class like halfway through. I've been, um, yes, uh, yeah. It's extreme. It is, it is an extremely helpful book. This is a picture of the author here, Charles Walters. Um, oh wow! Oh, never mind. Um, thank you for sharing that. I'll make sure to include that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to download this. Um, yeah, Adisa Ma just gave us a, a book in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be sharing that with everybody else later, but what I'm going to do, like I said, is I'm going to take the class. I'm going to take all five, four, four other recordings, make them into one recording with the additional questions and comments, and then I'll send that out to everybody. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, um, my email address is here. Um, uh, I have a podcast that I talk about here. And um, feel free to check those out. Email me anytime with any questions about plants. I'd love to talk about them um, as we've talked about them for about an hour and a half. Um, otherwise, um, I really appreciate you all being here, sharing your time with us and sharing your information and expertise and experience. 
um, sharing your question. Oh, future topics. That's an excellent question. I'm going to have to work with Che Axum, who divine, uh, who who uh, who created this um, this sheet. Um, I'm not necessarily sure yet what I'll be teaching next, but I am very much looking forward to teaching. Um, um, and uh, you know, I hope to be able to do something again like this in the winter time. I know that he was working on a fall planting sheet. And I will uh, be in touch with him. I'm going to call him as soon as we finish the class, and um, and I'll talk about what what we'll what we'll be able to do in the future. Um, is is that cool? And I mean, I have everybody's emails from from before. I don't. I mean, I haven't been able to identify who you are, user. But if you've um, if you've been been getting, obviously you've been getting the emails because you came to class today. But what I'll do is I'll let everybody know through the, that email, um, uh, you know, what I'm teaching next. Okay, so thank you all. And um, after an hour and a half, I'm gonna close class. Uh, I, uh, I'll be in touch with you all. I'll be getting, getting all this stuff out. I wanna get this stuff out very soon. Um, and I, and I really appreciate you all coming to the last class. It, 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 uh, really feels good to be able to share this information with you all. So thank you and have an excellent, uh, have an, you know what? I want you guys to have an excellent Friday because tomorrow is my birthday. I'm turning 30 tomorrow. And, um, and I want you guys to do it really big for me because we won't be able to obviously do it in person. Um, if you all if you all happen to drink um, drink a little bit of tequila for me, <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> um, but if not, you know, just uh, make sure to stay hydrated and stay healthy because um, all this stuff is 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 so crazy. Um, Sharon says also peas and oats can be planted during the springtime. It's in Johnny's seed mix. There you go. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you for the happy birthday. Um, Yes, um, yes, Adisa Mata, I'll be reaching out to you right after class. Um, um, yes, thank you, thank you for the happy birthday and thank you, user, for the happy birthday. I look forward to, uh, to seeing you all again on Zoom in the future. So um, I'm gonna stop uh, recording and, um, and I will say peace and thank you.